And welcome back to my show about raising positive women. Now, the first half of the show, we talked about what makes um, us the way that we are, what was our upbringing, and how has that impacted on our future selves. Now, uh, let's go to some of the messages. We've had somebody who has messaged saying that they have been they're a father of daughters, and they've tried to raise their children without the cultural bias. Uh, this person said they find it really difficult, well, somewhat difficult, because their wife is from Pakistan and she's brought up in a strict environment. So he said, my wife understands why we do what we do, but it's the, is it the question that keeps popping up? And it's the rest of the family. They're raising their daughters more traditionally. Um, food for thought, actually. How do you deal with that? When you're a little bit more relaxed in your approach, but then you've got people in the community who often question your intentions or have something to say about you. Um, and, you know, how does that impact on the way that you are? We've had somebody else saying they're loving the show. Thank you very much. They're saying it's really interesting. It's given them lots to think about. Um, they've said thanks for presenting lots of different viewpoints and experiences. It's given them a great insight, and um, they said, I guess it's something I wouldn't normally ask. Maybe it's something I might start asking. So that's fascinating to see, um, and it's lovely to hear. So let's now think about um, the idea of is it? Who holds it? Who questions it? And why? Um, I guess the word is it comes out of honour, and uh, it's the way that you carry yourselves in your, our community and it's the way that you present yourselves and it's the way that you are. And this has been a real hot topic, I guess, because so many things have come from that. And I guess that's been a motivation for a lot of the way that people behave and the way that families are brought up. So was this, as a girl, as a woman, did you ever feel like when you were growing up it was a huge deal in your family the way you behaved and the impact that that had on the way people treated you. For instance, I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, uh, when you were growing up, what, what was it like? Did you ever feel inferior to people or did you ever feel like you had to stop being your, your full self in case people judged you? And um, she said, and it was quite interesting actually because she's a mum of two girls as well, and uh, she said, she said, not really, she goes, her brothers were older than her, so she never feel, felt like she had less opportunity to them because she was still expected to stand in the family business. She was still expected... To, they had a shop as well. Uh, she was still expected to unload the van, stack the shelves, do all the things that her brothers were doing. But at family functions, she was the one that was expected to be in the kitchen. And she saw, it was almost a case of, well, that's what the girls do and the women do. You stand in the kitchen and you help and you do that. When the men, they did nothing. They sat in a room and, you know, they had conversations and they spent time with each other. And, and so now as a mum, she says, I won't allow my girls to, in inverted commas, help in the kitchen because she goes, I don't want them to ever feel like they can't sit with the men and they don't feel equal. And what's also interesting is this friend uh, works in a very male-dominated um, industry. So she battles a lot of that prejudice now where men are either not as understanding as her role because she's a career woman, she's a mum, she's a wife, so she has more to her and she carries more with her uh, when she goes to the workplace. And now, I guess, is a prime example. She's at home, yet she's expected to hold her place at the Zoom table in inverted commas in the same way that the men are, yet she's still a mum. She's still got two children who want to be homeschooled and who need her emotional attention. You know, And her husband is brilliant. He's really supportive and they have a really good balance between them. But I guess it's her holding her place at the in her workplace and actually having to say, hang on, this isn't fair here. I'm a woman and I'm a mum, yet these men have their wives looking after their kids and holding down the family and so they don't come with that baggage to the table so for her now because of the way that she was brought up she's really good at holding people account and saying that's not on that isn't right that isn't fair you know I'm just as important as my male counterparts and that's really helped structure her and for her to develop her voice and part of that I think is knowing I guess the idea that if you know better, you can do better. 
And that's a phrase that Maya Angelou, a very famous author, um, shared with Oprah, who's, um, who's a huge influence in female empowerment. And the idea is you will be a better person and you will do better when you know better. And a conversation that I had with my mum um, when I become a mum myself, we'd often talk about our childhoods and growing up. And she used to say, well, back then we didn't know any better. It was fine to let your kids stay up till really late. There was no structure. It was fine for, for them to eat lots of sweets and to do, you know, play outside and not to worry about this. And as long as you kind of made sure they weren't running riot, it was fine to do those things. There wasn't an idea of bedtime and all of those things. And when did we develop that? So when I speak to my sister and I speak to other women and I say, when did we become the, the parents that we are now? Because the parent that I am now is a mixture of the way that I was brought up, what I saw, my experience as a teacher, what I feel was right or wrong and what I see in, you know, in society about the way that other children are raised, as well as the influence of other brilliant women that I'm surrounded by. And one of those people is my sister-in-law. She had a different upbringing to us. She was brought up um, in a very white, I guess, community. Uh, her parents were very educated Pakistanis. They were very modern. They were forward-thinking. And so they had a lot more structure in their early upbringing. And the way that she brings up my nieces and nephews, you know, they had a really strict bedtime and a strict routine. And what they, the food they ate was heavily monitored and it was watched. And she was really keen on developing um, their early experience. You know, my niece and nephew were read to by both my brother and my sister-in-law from a very young age so when they were growing up when we watched that and it was a it was almost like a wow moment of actually that's how you raise children that's how you raise well-adjusted children so when I became a mum naturally we followed suit that's what we did so I made sure that my children had a, a very um, structured approach to their day we made sure that our children went to bed at seven o'clock every night they had a routine they had a set meal time. They made sure that we prioritised sleep in our house for our children because it's so powerful and important. And that all comes from the models of people around you. Now, as a parent, I guess what I've done is I've picked out the best bits of my childhood and picked out what my parents did and what my parents did well. And also looking at those influences of parenting around me. And as well as that, I guess a lot of it is the things that I see in school and things that I see happen in school, the children that do really well in school and the children that I've taught and that have done really well is because their parents always read to them. So that's something that I make sure that we do at home. We always read to our children. We always prioritise that. And the other thing that we also do in our house is we prioritise education. So we make sure that when the girls come home from school, they know they get changed into their home clothes, they know that their home atmosphere is different to their school atmosphere, and they have to do their homework straight away. You know, that takes priority. Homework always takes priority. Um, and the other thing that we do, I do in terms of my upbringing is um, we use the values that we were taught now. We learned to read Quran. We, were learned, uh, we learned about religion. We learned about values and morals. And ultimately, that's what our parents wanted to teach us, right? They wanted to stress and prioritise our values and morals and make sure that they made us realise that we belong to a community, we belong to a society, we are part of an ecosystem where we grow up and we represent who we are as people. You know, we're Muslims, we're British, we're Asian, we're Pakistani, we're women. So what do I pass on to my girls? Okay, And what will you, as a mum or as a parent, pass on to your children? For me, there's probably three things that make positive childhoods routines I think routines are really really important um, children should know what's expected of them from their routine and that happens from when they're really little it's really hard to establish a routine when a child is nine years old or ten years old it has to start from a really young age so from a very young age we established a routine in our house um, in terms of the expectation in for us, like what I'm, I'm really lucky that my husband is a really hands-on dad. So he does breakfast in our house because I because he goes out to work 
Um, I felt that he needed an opportunity to spend one-on-one time with the girls, with our girls, where he was the one in charge and it doesn't become, everything becomes reliant on mum. So he does breakfast with our girls. And I'll often hear the conversation between the, um, the three of them downstairs. And it's a conversation that probably wouldn't happen if I were there. And it's really valuable. He'll talk about his experience growing up. He'll talk about the things that his father brought to him in terms of his values and the hard work ethic that he, that's instilled in him. Like he would often talk about, um, you know, his experiences and his memories of who he grew up with and what he did. And, you know, and it's really, really valuable. So he takes part in their life by he does breakfast with the girls in the morning. Then he goes off to work. We do the school drop off on a normal school day. Uh, when the girls get home, they know there's an expectation of they take off their uniform. They do their homework straight away. And uh, then we have dinner at a set time. My husband joins us for dinner. And the routine is the girls join in with the housework. They join in with what they're expected to do. They all have chores. And that would be no different if I had girls and boys. If I had boys, they would do exactly the same. Because my husband is really, really good at doing things around the house. Um, And I'm really fortunate because my sister-in-law, who was 10, 11 years older than him... She instilled that in him. So he was very much brought up a lot by his sister. So he's got um, a real attitude of joining in and making sure that our house is immaculate. He picks up after himself. You know, recently he's cooking, which is a huge help. Um, so in terms of our household, we're really we're really balanced in our gender roles. Um, but going back to our routine, we have dinner, the girls go up, we have bath, we have bedtime, we have a story... You know, we run them through the day. We talk about what's going to happen later on in the day and they go to bed. Um, So routines are really, really important. And that starts from when they're really young. Making sure they get enough sleep is one of the biggest gifts you can give your children. Have a think about that. Making sure that your children get sleep, that you value the quality of sleep and making sure that screen time is few and far between um my daughter didn't have screen time until she was two because I didn't ever feel she needed that as a form of entertainment because there were so many other things we could do and even once she did turn two we're really careful about what we exposed her to Uh, she wasn't allowed on youtube there wasn't any of um you know free reign to having phones etc because for me phones was not a babysitting tool because there were so many other things we could do Um, I'm very fortunate I was able to take time away from my career to raise my daughters. I know that's not the same for everybody. And when time is difficult, you know, it is easier to, I guess, give somebody a phone or give a child a phone. But that's not always uh, the most constructive. So in raising my children, I felt... To limit the amount of screen time. Um, And even now, we're very careful with what we give them. I often see other um, families with young children and they're gripped to a phone and children uh, spend so much more time um, on social media or YouTube than they ever have been before. And as a teacher, I'm seeing the detrimental effect of that now. Children who really struggle to um, concentrate in class or who really struggle to join in to conversation or struggle to make eye contact, or are expecting everything to be spoon-fed to them in terms of their learning because they don't have the ability to think outside the box. Even very simple things like children's eyesight has become so much worse because they've become short-sighted, because they don't look into the distance anymore, because they don't kick a ball anymore, and they don't go outside and play because they're on a screen. So be very mindful about how much screen time you give your children. Then the next thing that I think that makes really positive parenting, and this is what I do with my children, is we set real, we have boundaries in terms of what we allow the children to do and what we don't allow the children to do. Um, As a teacher and a mum, I think I'm a little bit stricter than my husband is. Um, But I guess we've got mutual understanding of boundaries. Now, thinking back to our childhoods, That's what our parents imposed, right? They gave us boundaries. We knew that we weren't allowed to do this. We were allowed to do that. Our boundaries were a lot stricter because they didn't know any different. They didn't know, actually, we might be able to trust our daughters to be able to do X, Y, and Z as long as we make them understand that this could happen and we don't want this experience and we wouldn't want X, Y, and Z to happen. So 
boundaries was really, really important. And I guess in all types of parenting, whether it's parenting in the 80s, parenting now, boundaries is vital. So my daughters know that there are certain things they can and they can't do. And I think growing up, I would make sure that they know what their boundaries are. Um, Probably not as strict as, you know, my upbringing, but I need them to know that there are certain rules that we follow because we are Muslim. There are certain rules that we follow because that's the way that, you know, that's our identity. So have a think about that. What boundaries do we sh- do we um, put out there? Okay. Let's just go to one of our listeners. Um, she feels that positive reinforcement is really vital to raising positive children. She says, girls need to know that they're equal, not that it's their job to strive to be equal. Okay, that's a really interesting point. And um, another point that I, when talking about female empowerment, often people misinterpret that. And it's not a battle against men. We're not lessening the role of a man. We're just trying to raise it so we don't feel any less than a man. Okay. And somebody else uh, has messaged in and saying, uh, hello, love the show, very enlightening. I've seen women are more empowered as men have changed in our society. That's a very valid point, yeah. Our parents' generations had men who were expected women to run the household, including those who were working, as many did, and never change a nappy for children. Now men are helping raise children rather than expecting the role to be 100% on women. Even if you get the raised eyebrow from the older generation... Okay, that's fantastic. I think that's a really important point to make. Um, But ultimately, where does that expectation come from? Do we as modern mums have to make that expectation known to our husbands of, well, you're going to have to help me out here. And if we're going to raise our children to think that there's no division between men and women, are we going to show them that in the household? How does your household work? Do you feel that it's balanced in your house? Do you feel as though... Do you, um, you know, that you have that balance between what mums do and what dads do? Okay, so let's have a go back to um, our messages. I'll often get my girls to lead prayer and also have only one row when we lead prayer where girls and boys are together. I feel uncomfortable putting my girls in a row behind my son. That is absolutely amazing. That is so enlightening and so positive to see. I, um, when we pray at home... And I'll often ask the question to my husband, like, am I supposed to be behind you? I, you know, I'm equal to you. Do, where do we go? Um, so that's a really valid point. And I love the fact that those are people that are raising that now and raising the profile of girls and in our religion as well. I recently came across um, an article, and you'll have to tell me what you think about this, where it was about a female imam and how she was, um, how she led prayer in a mosque, I think, in Canada, and there was a huge backlash against it. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, The person that texted in and they said that they have one row at home, their girls are 18, 17, and then their son is 15 and 6. So um, I'm delighted. I'm absolutely thrilled that you raise the profile of your girls and they're just as important as your boys. Um, I've got somebody that says, Salam, great show, Shireen. Food for thought, many listeners. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. That's really positive to hear. Uh, So we're going to be running out of time soon. That has absolutely flown. Um, But let's think then, to summarise, how has your early experience growing up in an Asian household or influenced you as a parent? What would you do differently? What would you do that was the sh- what was the same? Um, some more messages that we've got coming in. Uh, somebody has said, it's not necessarily about being Muslim. This person grew up in a Sikh household um, and they said that a lot of what, they, what we're saying today applies to that Sikh religion too. Their parents tried to st- instill much of their religious beliefs on, on them, but it was in a way that, they just found overwhelming and overpowering. And as a modern parent, she said prejudice. She goes, I explained to my husband that he needs to pull his weight at home so our daughter knows what it's like to be to be mar- married to a modern man. And this is often the question that I, <laughs> I'm guilty of saying this to my husband. Would you want your daughters to be married to somebody like you? Have a think about that. As an Asian man, and if you've got daughters... Would you want your daughters to be married to a man who is like you? you know, and if that doesn't make you raise your game, 
you, you need to have, maybe have a think about that one. Okay, so that's really, that's really important. Right, now, today we've done lots of discussion about our upbringings. We've talked about our experiences growing up. We've talked about why we've had to question that what we've done uh, in terms of our society, we've looked at integration. What were our parents scared of? What were our parents ultimately scared of? When I said this to my husband, I said, what were our parents scared of and why were they so strict? And um, he said, ultimately, I guess there were a few things they were scared of. They were scared of we were going to go off the rails. They were scared that we were going to have relationships with boys, girls, um, and you know, bring shame on the family and we were going to be judged. They were scared that we were going to lose our values and we were going to go down the wrong path. They were scared that we were going to drink, do drugs and ultimately ruin the hard work that they've put in. And they did. They, you know, they grafted for years and years to give us a better life, to give us a better standing so they wouldn't have to, so we wouldn't have to do the things that they did. So, yeah, you're right. I think what were our parents scared of in terms of integration and why did they bring us up in such a strict way? Because they didn't want those things for us. And ultimately... As with all parents, you want better for your own kids, don't you? You want them to have the opportunities that you didn't have. Um, Growing up, I didn't learn to ride a bike. I I, I don't know if many women in their 30s are probably the same as me. I didn't didn't know how to ride a bike. My younger sisters did. Um, I didn't. And it was only when I went off to university that I taught myself. And now that my, my daughters are five and six, they ride their bikes all day long. And I love it because I know better and I do better you know that was something that I felt my girls I didn't do but I really want my children to do speaking to other mums I say you know what is it when you were growing up what didn't you do that you wish you had done and what do you do now for your children and some mums say um I never learned to swim you know it was about modesty and we were worried about you couldn't show your body so we never learned to swim but that's something that I absolutely insist my daughter knows how to do now what else is out there? What else um, did you feel that you never got a chance to do and you wish you had done? So let's have a think about it. Um, the other thing that has come in is um, we've had people talking about confidence as well. Because of their upbringing, they really lacked confidence in the way that they carried themselves in society I can understand it because growing up, the way that we brought up our daughters, our girls were expected to be a little bit more subservient, I guess, a little bit quieter, to have a little bit more of um, a a calmer demeanour. Boys typically fell into that gender role. They're expected to be the strong four leaders. They're expected to be up there. They're expected to be, you know, role models. They're expected to lead. We never expected our girls to lead. So what are we doing now to level that playing field? Okay, so think about confidence then uh, in terms of the way that we carried ourselves. Um, Somebody that I asked about her early experience, she goes, confidence was something I really struggled with and it took me ages to gain that. And it's something I probably struggled with a lot. She goes, growing up, you never saw women of colour regarded as beautiful. You never saw them as on adverts. You always saw Caucasian and white girls. So her idea of beauty was always that. And I guess a lot of our society, you know, we did favour the fair-skinned, light-skinned girls. Um, So, and a lot of what she had, her negative perception, came from having, you know, darker skin or being a girl. And it was a lot of it was from the pressure that the so-called aunties put on society uh, and the derogatory comments. And um, so re- that really knocked her confidence. And she goes, her confidence probably didn't grow until much later on in life. So she, because she goes, I struggled to find role models. She goes, I had my mum and my dad who wanted me to be better and to, you know, to do more with my life. But who do I ultimately look up to? And, you know, that's right, actually. Who was your role model growing up? I was really lucky. I had um, an auntie who was a teacher, and I remember going to college with her when I was a little girl and seeing this amazing life where people went around and they, you know, they were educated and they had friends and they did this. And she was a huge source of inspiration for me growing up because, 
You know, she was a teacher and she, she lived this true life. She made it work for her. You know, and even in the 80s when she was training to, in the 90s, training to be a teacher, she got married, but she still did it. So, you know, she made that work for her. We are running out of time, but I think there's some really important messages here that I'm going to read out from our listeners. We've got Asalaamu Alaikum. Great show. Thank you very much. Nice to hear refreshing and honest reflection of your upbringing. My upbringing has some similarities in that education was very important in our household, boy or girl. This means that both myself and my sister went on to university, entered professional careers. We were both allowed to play outside and we self-taught to ride bikes. I love that people really realise how important it is to ride a bike. Um, tied into this, we were strong role. We had strong role models and moral values rooted in our faith. While we were a very visually practicing family, there was always a strong sense of accountability for our actions instilled in us. And it was this that ultimately made us accountable for Allah, who we are, who we conduct ourselves. Honesty, fairness, kindness, respect, etc., were all values uh, that were readily.